Hello and welcome everyone. You have joined our lunchtime roundtable on reinventing the people and places left behind by globalization. I'm Richard Crispin. I'm the CEO of Collaborate Up and I'll be your moderator today. I'm so honored to be part of this illustrious uh, uh, collection of wonderful individuals here on our call today who are going to help us um, walk through a number of really tough issues that are facing our country and our world. Uh, this Lunchtime Roundtable is brought to you in participation with the Washington Times and sponsored by our friends at Philip Morris International, and I'm going to get right into it. Uh, over the last 50 years, technology, treaties, and trade have raised countless millions out of poverty and created vast wealth for nations and their elites. At the same time, large swaths of America and the world got left out. Globalization and the global prosperity it brought rests on an international system and a compact that bridged parties and borders, finding common cause in democracy, security, human rights, and economic growth throughout the free world. Yet frustration from left behind communities has driven populist and national reactions at a time of already heightened great power competition, threatening to undo the international system. The COVID-19 global pandemic has exacerbated and accelerated many of these trends, requiring leaders across the civil, private, and public sectors to wrestle with a new normal. Today, we're gonna to get into questions like, is multilateralism and the multilateral security framework dead? Has trust eroded beyond repair? And will the West's interests and supply chains continue to diverge from China's and Russia's? And how can we reinvent and reinvigorate poor urban and rural communities left behind by globalization as we try to build back better from our global pandemic? I'm joined today by some incredible, uh, incredible minds on this issue. Uh, I'm so grateful to have with me Indranil Ghosh, the CEO and founder of Tiger Hill Capital and the former head of strategy at the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Investment and Development Friend Fund. Indranil, can you wave to us, please? There's yeah. Indranil, Hi. thank you. Uh, we're also grateful for uh, Ambassador Mark Green. Uh, Mark, you're the executive director at the McCain Institute of Arizona State University and the former administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Welcome, Ambassador Green. Everyone. Uh, we're also joined by Martin King, the CEO of Philip Morris International America. Martin, welcome. Hello. And uh, Chip Pickering, the former member of the U.S. House of Representatives representing the state of Mississippi. Uh, Representative Pickering. Richard, good to be with you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Mike McKenna, a columnist with the Washington Times and the former deputy assistant to the United, president of the United States on energy issues. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Nilmini Rubin, the co-founder of Fix the System and a former senior advisor to both House and Senate committees on foreign relations. Uh, Nilmini, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, and Dan Rundy has come with us uh, from, the, uh, from the Center for Strategic International Studies, where he heads up the Project on Prosperity. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, and Connor Savoy, the Executive Director of the Modernizing, Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. Welcome, Connor. Thanks, Richard. Great to be here. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, Dr. Richard Wright, the Director of Sustainable Behavior at Unilever. Welcome, Dr. Wright. Thank you very much. Hello, all. So I want to get right into it. And, and Chip, I want to turn to you, if I could, please. Uh, you're a former representative from the state of Mississippi. Tell us about the impacts of globalization on the ground in your district and places like that around the country. You know, uh, so I represented the third district of Mississippi. I was elected in 1996. So right after uh, post NAFTA, and as uh, the trade and uh, agreement and its consequences and implications begin to be fully felt in places that I, in districts like I represented. So the third district of Mississippi goes from the eastern side of, of Mississippi to the western side. So from Natchez, Mississippi, through Jackson, through small towns in East Mississippi, to Mississippi State University and to Meridian, Mississippi. In almost every small town, you would have a, a textile, textile factory and plant, which was kind of the hub of employment. And it created you know, a thriving and healthy small town environment in many places around my district, combined with agriculture, uh, both poultry, timber, as well as other uh, types of small, low-skilled uh, manufacturing. After NAFTA, we, we had a concerted effort, uh, the leadership of our state and private sector uh, investment into automotive, aerospace, and defense. And in many of our uh, parts of the district, 
we made that transition. Our university towns, our urban, our suburban, we have Nissan and Toyota now in Mississippi, major aerospace and defense uh, contractors and plants. And those places, our economy and our towns and our communities have done well. But many other places have not done so well as the transition in trade and technology consolidated many of, of, of the, the corporate headquartered uh, companies in agriculture and in man manufacturing across the country. That was also effect, uh, felt in, in the, the Mississippi towns that I represented. In Miss, the Mississippi Delta, uh, a, a farm today is on average 10,000 acres. When I first went to Congress, maybe 1,000 acres. Uh, 10,000 acres can be farmed on average with eight people today. Just think about the, the magnitude of displacement of, of the way that we farm today in, in agriculture and the technology and precision agriculture and, and the ability to have driverless tractors and, and those types of, of technological changes in agriculture. Well, that's across the, the spectrum. So both trade and technology has changed the economy and the communities that I, that I represented when I was in con Congress tremendously. Some winners, some losers. So what would it look like as, as we go forward to, to have both rural America, which has felt left behind and damaged by trade and technology, to also feel the, the prosperity and the progress and the wealth that we've seen in our suburban, and urban, and university towns. And I, I, I today represent a group of, of companies and an association that is primarily the tech and the broadband industry, leading tech and, and broadband. And in the pandemic and the COVID, what we've learned probably as, 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 as directly as possible is that broadband connectivity makes a huge difference in, in remote learning, remote work, online uh, uh, education and, and the telemedicine, telehealth. And as you look to the future and the, and the networks of the future, the internet of things, advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, I think that, that the rural communities will, will, much like coming out of the Depression or World War II, need to have the type of national commitment and funds, federal funds and private capital, to flow into the 5G fiber and, and the network to the future more than any other investment. I think that that can make a difference of reconnecting rural America and small town America back into a system where education and healthcare can be of the highest quality. The, the community uh, and, the, and the family relationships can be preserved in the, in the benefit of those small town rural uh, values and, and, and communities uh, to the American fabric. And if we make the commitment like we did coming out of the depression to electricity, that we have universal access to the telephone and to, and to, to power to every home and every business, but now to the broadband connectivity to me, I, I believe that is, the, is the, the one single thing that we can do that would have the greatest return and to give opportunity to all parts of the country, whether it's rural or urban, underserved, and the low income communities that feel left out of the changes that have occurred over the last 25 years. Thank you. So what I'm hearing from you is that you know, broadly trade and technology have uh, undone a lot of the progress that was made in the post-World War II period. Um, a lot of communities did thrive if they had access to markets, if they had good technology, but those that didn't, particularly um, places that were disconnected, perhaps didn't have broadband, they felt left behind. And really what we need in order to connect these communities is um, like a Tennessee Valley Authority for broadband. Yeah, the, the national commitment that every person, every business, every home is going to be wired with fiber and, and, and wireless networks and satellite networks that really will give the connectivity and, and, and connect whether it's a small business or a farm or a student to the best opportunities and applications of the future. And I, so where technology has been disruptive, it can also be the solution for the future. Mm -hmm. What do you think is missing? Why, why do you think we haven't had that political will yet to do what you're saying? In many places, you, you still have entrenched incumbent interests of the old telephone and cable networks. Now you have insurgents, whether it's the tech companies or new fiber company entrepreneurial uh, investments in the new networks of the future, 
having to overcome the barriers to build, to deploy, and to, to bring the competition, the innovation that the, their networks uh, offer. So I, I, I see great progress across the board in a new consensus and a new commitment to deploying these networks and the federal funding. Uh, we, we look at all the different programs and we see about $165 billion over the next 10 years that are being dedicated today to connect schools, homes, businesses, hospitals, critical uh, institutions and community facilities into the broadband networks of the future. And I do think that that will have uh, probably as much of a positive impact as anything else that we could do as a nation. Terrific, thank you, uh, Representative. Um, Ambassador Green, I'd like to turn to you. Um, we've just heard from Congressman Pickering about sort of the lay of the land domestically. I'd like to get, as the former USAID administrator, uh, former ambassador to Tanzania, a congressman from Wisconsin, um, your, your, you, you get your international perspective, but also uh, welcome your thoughts domestically. But you've had a front seat on globalization's good and bad effects over the past few decades. Um, how do you think this is playing out internationally? Uh, well, Richard, thanks. Good to be with you and uh, great to follow my friend Chip. Um, so first off, uh, we have to make sure that we understand it isn't simply a matter of good and bad, it's a reality, right? Uh, innovations in transportation, communication, trade, investment, inevitably create both the opportunities and the challenges presented by globalization. At some points, not merely enough to curse the darkness, we have to make sure that we take advantage of it positives. Uh, it is, um, you know, indisputed that globalization has lifted millions out of poverty. In the U.S., it's lifted people out of the lower classes into the middle classes in terms of opportunities, including in rural areas like those that represented in Congress. In the developing world, it has lifted millions out of destitution and hopelessness. And that's an extraordinary uh, development, an extraordinarily positive development. It has created an opportunity for the exchange of ideas in ways that were unthinkable so not so very long ago. It has created a, a, a remarkable um, a vibrancy of exchange and ideas, but it has created challenges. We know that authoritarians see the same thing that those of us who live in, in a liberal democracy see, and so we see authoritarians bending globalization to their will. Some of it's in, in the form of state managed and state run economies, but it's also uh, you know, efforts to really um, steal the vibrancy of democracy and to hold people back and, and to try to um, prejudge results. So to me, those are the positives and negatives. But what I would say to Americans is that the opportunity it creates for us to leap ahead is fantastic. It, it is enormous. And I think we really have to spend some time taking a look at the adaptations that are in the developing world. So uh, for example, in West Africa, and I know this from my days at USAID, uh, there is a tropical weather forecasting app that uh, millions of African farmers have right on their, on their phones. And it gives them a 48 hour localized weather forecast each and every day. They get up in the morning, they get that forecast that tells them when to plant and when to harvest. That's an extraordinary thing. In Haiti, we have using 3D printers, uh, weather forecasting stations, mobile weather forecasting stations. Again, delivered by what is no longer new technology, but rather almost old technology. So I think what we need to do in the West is also take a look at how some of these more frugal innovations and adaptations of technology are being used in the developing world and see what we can do to harness, uh, quite frankly, that example and apply it in our own area. So lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, but I think this is one of those wake up call moments when we really have an opportunity in the West, particularly in the United States of America, to seize the opportunity and the lead and, and really set an example for the rest of the world. The innovation that is inherent in our economy and in our society is unmatched in the world. And there's no reason that we can't use this as an opportunity to leap ahead. Mm. 
So globalization is neither good nor bad. It is it's something we have to right. figure out how we're going to deal with it. Um, it. It's going to create winners and losers. It's going to create opportunities and challenges. Uh, we have to be careful to avoid uh, falling into perhaps the, the thrall of authoritarian state capitalism and those who are trying to entrench interests. I think uh, we heard from, from Chip that there are entrenched interests here in the United States. There are also entrenched interests in elites in other countries. We need to be cognizant of that and make sure that they're not holding all of the opportunities for themselves and sticking the rest of us with the challenges. And we have a great opportunity to leap forward. I guess my question to you, though, is the same, similar to the one that I, I asked, um, asked Chip. What's, what, when, I, when I remember the promise of NAFTA, and Chip, Chip mentioned NAFTA, I remember there's going to be a lot of transition assistance, a lot of um, you know, help for people who were going to be left behind. What's happened? Why, we, what, what do we need to do in order to make sure that that actually occurs, that we are actually funding and have the political will to reach out to those people who are, who are, who are stuck with the challenges? Yeah, well, well, first off, we need to continue invest, to invest in higher education. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring the opportunities and potentials and capacities of that education to rural America. And there's no reason that we can't. Uh, McCain Institute, as you noted, is part of Arizona State University, a remarkable university, which is able to project through a number of chan channels, digital content in higher ed all around the world. And so we need to be taking advantage of that as, as Chip laid out in rural areas to give people the tools that they need to compete and to succeed. You know, it, my in-laws continue to farm Northern Illinois crop farmers and they'll be the first to tell you they're not terribly sophisticated people, but they know that 95% of the world's population is outside the borders of the U.S., that if they can't have access to markets, if they can't uh, you know, utilize some of those technologies, they might as well plow the fields under. And on top of that, again, frugal technology. Every day when my father-in-law goes out on that great big giant green tractor, there are satellite feeds that automatically adjust what the moisture, read the moisture content in the soil and adjust the mix of what goes in. So there are all kinds of opportunities that technology brings. What we need to do is bring effective education to help people use it. Then, then finally, one other thing that, that I would add, as we look towards the future and what changes we need to make and in what investments we need to make, we have to be careful not to prejudge, and we have to be careful not to gear up to fight the old wars. In other words, we have to recognize that technology is constantly changing. Uh, we can't begin to guide it. We have to instead harness it. And so we have to look for ways to use the opportunities to be nimble and responsive. Not simply say, okay, you know, we need to make sure that we have uh, a, a school in every community in every neighborhood. Instead, we have to talk about how do we provide ongoing innovative educational opportunities for families. So not build and reinvest based upon old conditions, but instead try to make sure that we're always tapping into the leading edge of technology and innovative thought. So what I'm hearing you say is effective education combined with frugal technology and really understanding what the future is going to look like and not trying to plan for, for the last century, but really plan for the next century and embrace the opportunity in front of us. Um, Dan, Randy, I want to come to you. Real, um, you've heard a lot here from, from Congressman uh, Pickering as well from, from Ambassador Green. Um, you're at a think tank there in Washington, D.C. Uh, kind of help me connect some of these dots, if you would, please. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to apologize in advance. If there's any trumpet noises in the background, that's my, my kid playing, practicing trumpet. So I apologize in advance. Let me just say a couple of things. I think that there, because of COVID, we've been able to revalorize uh, rural areas. There's been an increase in value in rural areas. Think of all the people you know who are working remotely. I, I just emailed with someone this morning and said, I, I can't do lunch with you next week in a socially distant way, let me quickly add, because I'm in Montana. So, so that's the good news. I think about several, so Tulsa, Oklahoma is, is, has something called Tulsa Remote. They will pay you $10,000 to move to Tulsa to work remotely. They got something like just, just in the last couple of weeks, there was a big bump up in Tulsa remote, many of them from the Bay Area, saying they'll move from, from San Francisco to Tulsa. So that's an example. 
Chile has something called Startup Chile, which is if we want to start a business in Chile, they'll give you some a visa and some money. I, I'm of the belief we need to do something like that for Africa. I'd like to convince, I'd like to create a program for Peace Corps volunteers to keep 10% of all American Peace Corps volunteers to stay in Africa and start a business because we need a cadre of Americans who start a business in Africa. But I think COVID has helped, COVID has been an accelerator and a disruptor. And I think it's, it certainly has disrupted the, the urban rural divide in some ways and sort of re, rethought it. But it's also been an accelerator on the digital front. I, I agree on those comments about digital. I'm gonna argue that uh, there's been more e-commerce, more e-government and more distance learning shifts in the last 28 weeks than in the last 28 years. Now it's been disruptive, it's horrible. All of the growing pains, we've been forced to do it. But not just here, but around the world. And in many places, people are being left behind. That is not gonna be, I believe that the demand for digital connectivity is, is similar to what was said earlier, maybe by you, Richard, the Congress, uh, Congressman Ambassador Green, that um, is gonna mimic the demand for clean water, for to functioning toilets, and for electricity. It's gonna be that level of demand. It's gonna be unacceptable to have to connect to modernity without digital connectivity. Now, I can tell you right now, China's got a pretty good offer. So we can choose. We can either let the OECD countries in the West and hopefully the United States of America provide that connectivity, or we can let China help China solve that problem. But someone's gonna solve that problem. So I think, so there's been, a, there's been an acceleration on this digital front. We've been digitally transformed. That's why we're doing this. We've all been digitally transformed. Um, a couple of other points. At the same time though, my favorite uncle, my father's one of 10 kids. My favorite uncle lives in Southern Maryland, 60 miles from here. I visit him at least once a month. He does not have access to, to the fast Wi-Fi stuff. He's got like a cell phone thing and it's a problem. He gets, his, he gets his Netflix movies on DVD by mail. And that's 60 miles from here. He's a very sophisticated guy. He's the former chairman of the vet board of his state um, and very prominent in veterinary field and, and one of the smartest people I know. So if we can't do it 60 miles from DC, we got a problem. And I think it, so that problem's been accentuated. So this is not a, so this is just, this is a fixable thing and it's gonna have mm. to be fixable. May, make, let me make two other points and I'll stop. I still think partnerships are necessary. We're still going to need higher part, the kinds of partnerships that shifted um, the research triangle park in North Carolina. Maybe the playbook is evolving and adapting, but a partnership between business, civil society, higher education and government, it's still needed. It's still needed. It may, we may have to update the playbook, but it's still needed. Finally, this issue of trade. I like, I know this sounds a little, I like having avocados 12 months a year. I like having grapes, seedless grapes 12 months a year. Now that's maybe an elitist statement, but I like having an iPhone. I like the car I get. I like having Amazon stuff, delivers stuff to my house. And guess what? We're going to see a lot more of that. So if you like any of that stuff, then you probably like trade and globalization. So I agree about globalization. There's going to be some shifts in globalization, but I don't think we're, I don't think people are going to vote to end not having grapes and avocados and, Amazon deliveries anytime soon. So they're going to be, so you're going to see trade shifts because I think we're not going to ever want to be held hostage again. If China says, you know what, I'm going to cut off your PPE or your meds because I'm unhappy with you. Like that's over. So what you are going to see are tectonic shifts in trade. And I also think this is an opportunity for nearshoring and onshoring. This is an opportunity for our partners in the Western hemisphere but it's also potentially, a, 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 I'm not gonna say we're gonna bring every factory back or renew everything, but there, with these tectonic shifts in trade, rural America and, and parts of America that I met may have a chance to kind of re-engage in different ways. And we need to be aware of this. Governments need to be aware of this. Local and state governments need to be aware of this. Universities need to be aware of this. And we need to enable and encourage incentives. Let me stop there. Thanks, Dan. Um, Congressman, I want to come back to you real quick, though. Are you buying Dan's uh, core argument here, in particular his points about that COVID has actually increased the value of rural communities and rural land? Very much so. And so you, you see the migration trends, both from Central and South America and Mexico into the U.S., but also the, the in migration for the best and the brightest in a state like mine, Mississippi, to places like Nashville, to Atlanta, to Dallas, to Houston, Austin, we did, we did suffer brain drain. 
what we're seeing right now in Jackson, Mississippi, is that you can't buy a house in, in, the, in the residential areas of, of Jackson because young people are coming from all those urban centers, whether it was New York or San Francisco, back home. They want to be close to family. They can work remote. They like the lifestyle. And if they have the connectivity that allows them to, to work remotely and have all the services that modern uh, tech companies provide, whether it's Amazon or, or Netflix, then all of their needs are met, but their, their family and relational community needs are much uh, better met in those types of small and mid-tier cities across the country. So I do think that we're gonna see through this pandemic and corona and the new drive for digital connectivity is a, is a possible resetting of migration patterns within the United States. Hmm. So good for rural America, good for, for the, the, the mid-tier cities across our country, whether it's a Jackson, Mississippi or Little Rock, Arkansas, that those places can see a resurgence and a renaissance. And with technology, the new, the, the second thing I, I, would, I would just add to it, we, we do have to have a new infrastructure of education that, that focuses on computer science, STEM, and coding. And we're beginning okay. to see that in a state like Mississippi where coding academies are sprouting up all through our state to train the workforce of the future to meet the technology and the trade of the future. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, and Trinell, I want to come to you. I want, I'd love to, we've heard a lot about the United States and sort of the American view here. Let you advised Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth and Development Fund. You're a global investor yourself. Um, would love to hear your kind of perspectives on the Middle East, uh, the view from, from London, and the Global South. So react to what you've heard here, and in particular about how you think globalization is playing out in those places. <clears throat> well, some of those places like uh, the Middle East and the Global South have definitely been some of the biggest beneficiaries of globalization. So you take a place like Abu Dhabi or like Singapore, and they really set themselves up as entrepot economies where they began by, you know, uh, building economies around trading and, and transportation, uh, ports and, and airlines, but gradually used, you know, the surplus in those economies uh, to reinvest and build up manufacturing, to build up financial services, tourism and retail, and became more diversified uh, economies. And some of them have gone on to even become regional hubs for media and you know, corporate headquarters for all sorts of other industries. And that playbook is being replicated or attempted to be replicated by many other similar places like in Panama or Istanbul to, to varying degrees of success. And I think that's a model that you know, any um, hub city uh, you know, can, can take on. But, you know, the problem, I think, with uh, this no, new COVID disruption is that many of those very same industries that rely on globalization are facing severe challenges because as we, you know, put some of that globalization on breaks or even reverse due to the reduction in, you know, business and tourist traffic and retail and, and some of the flow of manufactured goods, these industry, these countries are being, you know, severely hit despite their diversification. Um, when it comes to some of the global south, the, the southern hemisphere countries, I think they also benefited tremendously from, um, you know, export of commodities of manufactured goods based on labor arbitrage or other factors, and even shareable, tradable services like business process offshoring. Now, some of that will, will actually be enhanced because of the, the tradable nature of digital goods like, you know, like traded services. But some of the other things, you know, again, have been hit hard. So those economies really need to sort of invent, reinvent themselves, similarly to what we've been talking about in terms of the rural America or parts of America that have been left behind, because they face similar challenges now. They need to enter a digitally connected economy and start being start to be being good at other things. Um, now, <clears throat> I think some of the comments around, um, you know, uh, you know what happens. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, and uh, to the extent to which there, should, there could be decoupling there, or needs to be de decoupling there, I think that's a very important question because um, I think you know in some sectors it makes a lot of sense for security and resilience, so things like PPE, healthcare, and other sort of security-related sectors. It also makes sense to overinvest and double down in industries which are new and where the the, the sort of regional leader or the global leader hasn't yet emerged. It makes sense to compete, especially if you're a large economy like the US 
or the European Union collectively with a large you know, market to, to make a place for, for market leadership in those industries. And that's things like you know, batteries and electric vehicles, hydrogen, you know, many of the sort of technology-based industries like education and healthcare that we've been talking about, which can now really you know, take up a, a global audience from you know, one service or production hub, so mm. to speak. So I think um, you know, the, 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 where the you know, key goods and services are produced and where they're consumed and how they're connected is a map that's you know, totally up for you know, transformation and reshifting. And every location needs to, to, to think about how they can put their best foot forward and be competitive in, in, that, new, in, in that new economy. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask you for some investment tips. So if I'm thinking, you, know, you said I, we should be looking out for in industries uh, where there isn't a, a dominant leader. We've seen a number of big policy shifts like decoupling and the EU's Green Deal. I mean, wh where should I be looking for the winners? Wh wh who's going to win or who's going to lose out of this next wave of innovation driven by things like, you know, I think one of the big, big, big areas that, that does not have a current winner is the so-called green economy. Um, also things like the rise of um, environmental, social, and, and governance related uh, programs within companies. Uh, your thoughts? I think some of the, the, the sectors that you know, really stand to do well in terms of investment are sectors where um, you know, investment and development really increases the access of basic services to large you know, numbers of people, particularly those at the bottom of the pyramid. So those are things like what we talked about, broadband connectivity, um, digitally traded services uh, and goods, um, financial, uh, fintech and financial inclusion, which allows capital to get to underserved populations in remote places and helps to drive you know, their businesses forward and actually creates a huge spillover effect in the overall, overall economy and maybe at least the resurgences in centers um, that have been left behind. So I think those are, are critical areas. I think there are other areas where the way we produce things stand to be completely disrupted beyond imagination over the next 20 or 30 years. So we've talked a lot about agriculture. So what about the idea of large scale indoor vertical farming where you can grow 365 days a year? Day uh, it looks like we may, in general, may be frozen. And give in general one second to come back. Um, you know, kind of, you know, almost replacing, but not uh, completely, you know, um, dis disintermediating some of these communities that currently produce, but just produce in a different way. These are areas I think could be great areas of investment. So we need to look at sectors, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, Andrew, I think your, your um, video may be frozen, but we'll try to come back to you. But we need to look at sectors where there is opportunity for big disruptions particularly in basic services like broadband and digital trade, fintech and, um, and agriculture. Um, I'd also love to hear just really quickly if we can, if your connection remains stable, your thoughts on the Green Deal, the EU Green Deal. I think that European Green Deal is, um, you know, a, a, a seismic shift in, in, in policy. Not a shift, but like a seismic policy agenda because it's, it's, it's affecting every country in the European Union. They're all being asked to put forward plans to support um, the, the rollout of you know, energy transition infrastructure, of broadband connectivity, of new, entire new sectors like hydrogen. It's been supported by public money, but in a way in which it's trying to bring in private capital and institutional capital as well. So often institutions like the in European Investment Bank seeding funds, but then inviting other private capital to, to sort of crowd in and then drive forward investments in some of these critical infrastructural areas which as I explained, I think will be key to unlocking new economic activity that we haven't had before. Terrific, thank you, Janelle. Uh, Mike McKenna, I wanna to come to you. I know you have to leave in a few minutes. Um, you've got a very important meeting to go to. Uh, what I wanna ask from you though, is what I heard from Representative Pickering was that we need a national commitment to broadband connectivity to reinvent these, these rural uh, and disconnected areas of our country. I've heard from Ambassador Green that we um, need similar kinds of approaches, not just the United States, but abroad. We need frugal technology combined with smart education. Um, and I think Dan kind of helped to connect those dots. And 
just now from Injernil, we've heard we need to be investing in places that are not dominant by other, other, other people. A lot of that stuff requires energy. I know you were the energy advisor to the president. Um, I'd love your thoughts on energy and I love your thoughts on do we need a national policy or national strategy, not necessarily exactly like the Green Deal at the EU, but on that scale for thinking about how we reinvent our economy. Yeah, um, a couple of things, right? Uh, first off, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a fact person. I'm not a, I'm not a theory person. Um, and the fact is you got about 3 billion people on this planet who don't have electricity on a routine basis, right? That's a, that's a ridiculous number. And all the digital and rural broadband and all that happy talk doesn't mean anything if you don't have a plug that you can plug into something and you're going to have reliable electricity. So, so that's right, thing one. Thing two, um, you know, there's, there's two things, two, two words that have been roaming through my head as we've been talking, right? One is, and, and Chip um, mentioned it and, and Ambassador Green mentioned it, but not in the word I'm about to use, right? And that's balkanization, right? Um, as we um, create a, a, a brave new world, right? We need to be careful about balkanization. Um, and I'll give you a real specific example of balkanization. It, it's not just about, um, you know, rich and poor in Africa or South America. It's about rich and poor in the United States, right? Um, California has been um, going through some rolling black blackouts recently, right? And for the most part, there hasn't been public outcry about it, despite the fact that they've been severe and affected millions of people. Uh, and the reason why there hasn't been public outcry is because the system is balkanized. If you're a rich person or a company, you have a behind the meter generator and you don't really care about the blackouts. If you're a middle class or, or a, a lower class schnook, like, you know, like me and my friends, you care because you're getting the full brunt of it. So as we think about you know, what we're gonna do internationally, we need to be careful. We need to be aware of, of the potential for balkanization. Right? And then the second thing is, um, and I'll cycle back to the European thing in a second. I, I, know, I know you asked me. The, the second thing is, is that the overhang on all this conversation is the China problem, right? Um, you know, the, the, uh, the reality of it is it, it, it it's going to be a generational problem. You know, I, I understand everybody's anxious to, to think about COVID changes as secular, right? After 28 weeks, I hesitate to call something a secular trend, right? Um, no offense, Congressman Pickering, I doubt very seriously people from Brooklyn are gonna to move to Itawamba anytime soon or in great numbers, right? Um, so, but with respect to China, we now have, uh, 20 years of trade normalization experience with China and normalization didn't work, it failed. And I don't think that anybody's gonna take the foreign policy or, or, or pro-trade establishment in this country seriously until they just say, look, that was a failure. Um, and that brings me to my third point, right? Globalization, you, you said, hey, globalization, you know, good thing, everybody agrees with that, you know, it's generally positive. Truthfully, we've been having now a 10 year long conversation in this country about whether globalization is a good thing or a bad thing. And you have a lot of people on both sides and I'm perfectly comfortable with that, right? I'm politics, politics. But for us to just assume everybody looks at it through the same lens we do, probably a mistake. Now to answer your question, um, yeah, you know, if you're gonna be serious about China, if you're gonna be serious about balkanization and if you're gonna be serious about trade, you need to be serious about getting in front of um, a batch of different technologies uh, or technology groups, right? 5G, um, electric power, um, anything related to defense. And you're going to need to get serious about, as Dan said, onshoring or nearshoring, right? Um, the idea that we're going to continue to have supply chains originating or transiting through China is, is just not going to be sustainable over time. That's just not the way the world's going to work. Um, so we're going to need a plan. And, you know, this administration hasn't done a great job, but at least they've opened up the conversation on it. I expect whoever comes next is going to, um, having, having let it marinate for a while, they'll have a better sense of what needs to be done. So that's a, that's a long answer to a short question. I apologize about that. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to take that back, though, to, to Congressman Pickering, to Dan, to Ambassador Green, or to Andrew Nill. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Mike's laid out here, there's no, there's no broadband without electricity, so what do we do about that? But more importantly, I, I come, come back to this issue of balkanization, both balkanization in terms of the impact that globalization has had 
and the differing views. And I think that's sort of the crux of our question here is that many of us, I think on this call, many of us who are listening in have been net beneficiaries of globalization. There are those who were not net beneficiaries. They are not happy about that. And they, they keep telling us they're not happy about that. So what do we do differently moving forward that will address some of Mike's concerns? And I, I throw that to any of the, any of the prior speakers. Yeah, Martin, Ambassador Green, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I agree with many of the points that he made. A couple of things, and, and again, I think we have to realize that we can talk about good and bad, and um, each of us has a point of view, but it's also how we succeed given the reality. So uh, what I worry about sometimes is that back here in the U.S., we think of the U.S.-China action, and I'm a, I'm a cold warrior from way back, only in bilateral terms. We think in terms of how much we can tweak them and what they do in response, and that's not what this is about. It's competition. This is great power competition in our ability to compete in other markets. And it is a battle of ideas, it's a battle of opportunities, and it's whose rules are gonna set the world, and it's uh, for all the marbles. Because China's policies uh, have profound negative ramifications for the countries involved and quite frankly, for us. So that's a reality. Secondly, there's another piece to this as we start to talk about the different technologies. Uh, I'm often asked what I see as the great challenge in the world today, obviously COVID, but on top of that, it's displacement. We have 71 million people displaced in the world. They're not where they were and they're not where they're going to be. A lot of it's because of tyrants like Maduro and war and tyranny in Syria. But we've got people on the move. And unless we figure out ways of utilizing nimble technologies, often frugal technologies, to connect with those folks, to bring them into our way of thinking and our, our set of rules, it's going to be very hard for us to succeed. Just in the COVID case, for example, when you're fighting a pandemic, you're only as strong as your weakest link. If you don't provide access to vaccines all around the world, then you're always at risk of COVID or some evolved form of COVID coming back. So we have to, as we, as we take these challenges on, we have to think in terms of, of third countries and a competition of ideas. And we have to think in, in terms of utilizing nimble technologies that allow us to connect with people who are on the move. But the final piece to it is, if we fail to connect with displaced communities and that young generation that may be born in camps or in displaced villages, we're seeing the seeds for a whole new round of violent extremism and challenge in the future. So, you know, I, I think those are important realities as we take these challenges on. The good news is we still have the most vibrant economy on the face of the earth. We have the most entrepreneurial culture on the face of the earth. And so even with all of these challenges, which are frustrating to so many of us, we are still ideally situated to succeed if we're smart in our policies and in the investments that we make. And Janelle, I'd love to, uh, Mike, I will come back to you, um, but Janelle, I'd love to hear your views uh, you know, as the non-American non -American voice in this uh, conversation here. I think this is a, you know, a, a time when place-based com competition um, you know, uh, is going to see its day in the sun. And what I mean by that is, if you think about, you know, take the example of energy, and what do you do if, you know, you don't even have energy, how can you have you know, broadband connection? Well, the future of energy is going to be both incredibly con concentrated, but also incredibly distributed. And you have more options now on how to set up the place that you're in with the right uh, infrastructure and technology to be successful. So what do I mean by that? So for example, you know, what they're doing in Saudi Arabia for, 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 at the moment uh, is, is for example, using that incredible solar intensity that they have to build large solar arrays. And they know that they can't use all of that electricity locally. There's, there's just isn't the a market for it, but they're building, you know, the early stages of building hydrogen gigafactories to convert that energy to hydrogen and transport it cheaply to other markets which are you know, gonna require that clean energy as clean energy becomes a more and more of a requirement. On the other hand, you have the ability to have with a solar panel and a battery, 
distributed energy or dis you know sort of a microgrid practically anywhere on the face of the earth and be completely energy independent. And still, therefore, you know, with, with broadband connection and other digital means, be connected to any marketplace you can imagine. So that land in the desert, you know, when oil is you know, obsolete, suddenly has all kinds of new value as a production, centralized production hub for, for everywhere. Whereas, you know, the village in Malawi also can have energy and, you know, have a, you know, a thriving economy. I think it's a question of how we take these, you know, new technology and, you know, investment options and configure it in each place to be super competitive on a global level. Yeah, and I'm hearing a lot of echoes of what Mark said earlier, what Ambassador Green said earlier about making sure that we're not fighting the last war. So yes, we need energy, um, but how we do that will look different in the 21st century than it did in the 20th. Uh, Mike, back over to you. Yeah, just real quick. First off, let me agree with everything the ambassador said. Um, you know, we're still, uh, with respect to China, we're still looking for our Telegram X, right? Um, we, we haven't um, figured it out yet. Um, you asked the question, who's going to win the, the competition with respect to technology and innovation? That, that answer is easy. The Americans are going to win it. That we, that's what we do. We win stuff, especially in technology and innovation space. So um, that's going to happen there. And then, you know, what Idranel just said was kind of interesting. You know, he, he pointed out batteries and solar, right? That goes right back to the China problem. Best battery maker on the planet right now is BYD, which is not a completely wholly owned subsidiary of the PLA, but it's pretty close. And you know, who makes most of the solar panels? No, it used to be the Germans and the Americans. Now it's the Chinese. So you know, the, this 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 competition, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, going to occur all over the place, right? Not just not just in nice clean places. Great. Well, th thank you, Mike. Um, I want to turn our conversation here and maybe take a little bit of a, uh, of a turn um, and bring in uh, Dr. Wright here to our conversation. Um, and I want to do that by recalling something that, that Dan Rundy said earlier in the conversation about the need for partnerships. And, you know, you're, you're um, there at Unilever, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of work um, collect on collective impact and, and working together. Uh, and one of our framing topics was about the future of multilateralism um, and how that might impact a company like Unilever as you try to do not only the core business of Unilever, but also work together with um, people in, in communities that are also disconnected and, and feel left behind. Um, your, love your views on the whole conversation, but in particular about how you're working on collaborative impact programs um, in, this, uh, in this difficult time. Yeah, thanks Richard. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll comment on the on the conversation so far, and then maybe I'll link now into your question. Um, so I would do a lot of work. I can't extrapolate to to the states, and as the as the second non-American person, I wouldn't try and do that. But in Africa and South Asia, to so the global south, there, I think it's important to draw a distinction between technology and innovation. So if you uh, take a couple of simple examples, there are a lot of bro broken, broken pumps in Africa because actually the provision of pumps wasn't enough to actually sustain water because the ecosystem around them, the support wasn't put in. If you look at the, the toilets in rural India, people still defecate in the open because actually the cultural sensitivity wasn't taken into account and, and, and the cultural practice. And if I take my, my time, uh, I went into a school in rural Zambia and they have 30 boxes of computers. They'd been there two years and nobody would used them. So the provision of technology and innovation are two different things and how things land and how you you allow people to use them and and understand will be hugely sensitive the provision of technology is not innovation in itself and there's some huge challenges there and this is where we need collaborative action because if you um if you look at the the challenges within the challenges i see within somewhere like africa um this uh, global warming is making things unreliable in terms of crops. Well, the crops are becoming unreliable because of the weather, whether you believe uh, the global warming or not. 
um, and actually need to build resilience with um, poor, illiterate um, farmers that don't necessarily use a smartphone or anything like that. So actually there's a digital desert, there's an ability, an ability and an inability for them to understand how to use that technology to help them. If you look at the, um, the demographics, there are a lot of young people. In fact, most school leavers will go into the informal economy. So you need an ecosystem solution to enable them to actually earn a living. This is not a single innovation. This is how does the digital economy work for them? How do we use, and I, I think you said, let's not solve yesterday's problems, let's solve tomorrow's problems, which is post-COVID and the demographics happening. And the only way I can see out of it is digital. And the only way that we can work and, and drive kind of economic, economic prosperity, which we rely upon for developing our markets, is to work collaborative, both with nimble um, SMEs that have a digital capability, with multinationals like Microsoft who have the ability to scale things, with things like the Gates Foundation who have the ability to convene. So, I mean, look at multilateralism and you think about it in terms of government action. For me, it's, it's, a, it's a real cross-sector. And if we're going to meet the SDGs, then the cross-sector collaborations really are needed to actually land innovation in these places rather than just technology. Now, I don't know how that would extrapolate to rural America, but I guess there, a lot of people sitting in there are quite different to people like you and me. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how they use technology and the meaning of technology will be quite different to us mm -hmm. sitting in our nice homes. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Dr. Wright. I, a couple of things that you're saying there that, that I want to loop back to some of our other um, panelists. I think w w one thing I heard there, particularly in like your rural Zambia example, I'm guessing that the reason why they didn't use those computers is because they didn't have electricity. Is that true? Um, it's you know? not electricity. They don't know how to use them. They don't have to. Ah. Them. They don't know what the offer is. Okay. We saw rural Wi-Fi in rural Kenya cheaper than 4G, people don't use it because they don't have the content or the offer or the understanding. It's not just technology. It's a lot, I think uh, Mike talked about electricity. Electricity is important, but there was a whole lot of other enabling factors and the computer will break at some point and it's better to fix them. So they, so they need to have the technology, but they also need to know how to use the technology. Um, and I, I want to loop back to Andrew Nell and to Ambassador Green. I think one of the, um, there, I think there's really several interesting things that Dr. Wright said there, but one was about uh, the importance of, of cross-sector collaboration. The second one that I heard there was also about the focus on the informal economy. We've talked a lot about the formal economy. I know USAID does a lot of programming in developing countries. I'm not sure how much it does on trying to help people in the informal economy. Uh, so I'd love to explore that and also um, you're thinking on, on the importance of digital um, and bringing those people back in. And Andrew, if I could come to you first, connecting people into the formal economy through digital. What are your thoughts, particularly when you think about the Global South and what are the investment opportunities there? Well, I think <clears throat> digital is, a, is an amazing opportunity to um, you know, connect people at the bottom of the pyramid in general, not just in the Global South, through, as we've talked about, remote learning, uh, through you know, financial inclusion, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and getting capital into their businesses, capital into their communities, um, getting services like healthcare and other things to places where they didn't get go, go to before, um, and you know that's I think a fundamental um, opportunity. But I think digital also has the, 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 the potential to disrupt the economics of, of life because the economics of life has become very lumpy. It used to be that you know, you basically didn't have to pay that much to get a higher education. Or in some countries like the UK and Europe, it was actually completely free. Um, now, not only has it become very expensive and crippling in terms of debt in some cases, but not only do you need a bachelor's, you might need a master's and then for professional certification. So by the time you're earning, you're in debt, you have fewer earning years left. And as skills obsolesce far more rapidly, um, you know, maybe your earning potential 
from all these degrees doesn't last for very long. So you're back into the gig economy after 10 years. So that's a very precarious existence. And in an aging world in general, you know, you know there are fewer taxpayers per population you know, alive, then um, you know, you're kind of in a, in a bit of a vicious circle there. Well, how can we use digital to sort of you know, smooth out the economics of life? If you can actually you know, give high quality job relevant education you know, and make people job ready much earlier, give them bite-sized injections of you know, reskilling um, and support them to move to where the jobs are. Um, that kind of capability digitally you know, rendered actually then has huge knock-on effects because mm. now those people earn earlier, they may be able to re re work remotely through digital means, live in a lower cost, more affordable location, have a larger family, potentially begin to re reverse aging and the social security and tax problem that you know, aging is causing. And you can basically almost see a you know, reversal of the, 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 the vicious cycle we've got ourselves into by you know, having a more and more expensive um, and less affordable you know, lifestyle in terms of basics like education and healthcare. That I think is the real power of digital disruption. That's yeah, and, and a lot, and I, I, I want to come back to you, Dr. Wright. Um, one of the recurring themes I'm hearing in this conversation is not refighting the 20th century. We need to perhaps rethink our education system. Right now, we front load it all into the first part of life, and then we sort of let everybody loose in the latter part of life. We need to leverage our digital infrastructure to create more of a lifelong learning so that we're not loading people up with all the education early that might become irrelevant and also probably incurs a lot of debt but be able to have them skill and reskill throughout the course of their lives. Uh, Dr. Wright, your thoughts here, and I'd also love your thoughts on some of the examples of programs and projects that you're doing collaboratively with official donors like USAID or with uh, uh, NGOs or socially responsible investors around the world. Yeah, um, I just, so I just want to come back on, the, um, I absolutely agree. Um, I think it's moving people from back into the formal economy is a huge opportunity in digital. The challenge is whether the formal economy is going to be big enough to sustain the whole population. So we're talking about the excluded. If you take Kenya, the estimate is that actually only 7% of school leavers will get jobs in the formal economy. So you have 93% of school leavers that you will need to support within the informal economy. And actually that's an opportunity for digital. And the only way you can do is by networking, providing gigs and, and and actually think of a different way that work, um, to make work work for those people. So I think there's a, I think formal economy is not dead, but it's not gonna, it may not be big enough in every country and particularly where the demographics work against you. It may actually be bigger than the States and it might be big enough in Europe, but we don't know. And we don't know what was happening post COVID. Um, in terms of projects, I think that one of the, the projects I'm really proud of is one where I work with a, a, a company called Sujaz in Kenya. And what they're trying to do is create a, it's create a LinkedIn, essentially for what's called hustlers. They're low income um, youths. Um, they, um, they need the networking, they need skills, they need financial inclusion, they need a digital record, they may need identities. And there's a, there's a whole opportunity to bring them into a social network to do good for them. It also enables them to actually get potential kind of link, um, links to gigs or jobs and things like that and the information. So I think the, the social networking for good and the ability to do that within informal networks is hugely kind of mm. exciting for me. Mm. Um, and I think some of the technologies that we've got, particularly developed in uh, the innovative uh, country of the USA, are actually appropriate as long as we adapt them correctly in a culturally sensitive way. Mm. Um, I want to go to Ambassador Green and then to Martin King, but before I do that, fascinating project, but what's Unilever's interest in that? When I think Unilever, I think soap, I think teas, I think foods, why, why would you care about a, a LinkedIn for social good? Well, um, it's really for me the potential future. I mean, I work on the, the future, some, some fairly near, nearby kind of projects, but actually one of the reasons I work with UK Aid is because we look for social good and we look at future looking. So what's happening mm -hmm. to 
you risk some other projects and we work on them being a, a commercial now. Um, the future of distribution. Mm, I see. So I've got youths in, in rural Kenya or rural Africa with smartphones that sit by the smallholder farmers or the, or the last mile shopkeepers. And I need to find a way of accessing these people who are digitally excluded. Now, the, the rural youth with the smartphone is a potential way of doing rural distribution at an affordable level and getting goods and services out to those things. And Indranil talked about things like telemedicine. That's the opportunity to connect. But actually, sometimes you can't connect directly with your end user. You need to actually have the intermediate things. So... Hmm. I think in terms of reinventing the model of how Unilever interacts with the informal economy, it's hugely important. I also think a business sitting in, in Africa needs to do something about jobs. Mm. I think it's a, it's a purpose thing. It's actually, you can't sit in, in Africa without kind of um, creating some positive impact. Terrific, thank you, Dr. Wright. Ambassador Green, um, we've just heard from, from Dr. Wright that uh, the formal economy in these countries will not be big enough to absorb all of the people leaving school. Um, what do you think um, bilateral official donors need to be um, thinking about when it comes to what, what that means for the future of, of economic growth in those countries? Uh, well, Richard, you began this part of our conversation by talking, using the term collaboration. And as you may know, uh, this goes back to my USAID days. I don't use the term public-private partnership. I don't like mm -hmm. the term public-private partnership because it's been used in so many places to mean so many things. It's lost all meaning. Uh, public-private partnerships is used by many to have government go to Unilever and say, here's our program, give us some money and we'll do it. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, uh, we're surprised when Unilever says, gee, that doesn't quite fit with our purpose collaboration, which is the key to the future, is bringing people together, bringing entrepreneurs and bringing business itself together at the front end of the discussion and say, hey, here's something we all want to take on the social good. What are your ideas? And making sure that local businesses are in the room because you'll design something that will be efficient, effective, and also uh, geographically and, and culturally um, uh, workable. You know, something that uh, Richard said early on that I, I don't think we can emphasize enough, and you know, I've spent a, a bit of my career in Africa, the difference between innovation and technology. When it comes to innovation and work ethic, there are few places in the world that will match Africa. Uh, in so many communities, what they have done with just a small taste of technology is extraordinary. And, and there really is an eagerness to learn. It's just that we present the information through Western eyes and Western ways and Western yeah. channels and wonder why in the world doesn't work. I'll never forget, mm -hmm. uh, this goes back to my days as ambassador, so 10 years ago. I heard this story from a friend of mine who was a member of the parliament. In his community, which had poor connectivity, they discovered there was one small area in the community about the size of a picnic table in which you had cell phone reception. Nowhere else, and they couldn't figure out why. So he told me that every single day, young men in the surrounding community would go around with plastic bags and collect up everybody's mobile phones. And then they would stand in line, take it and hold it over that picnic table sized area. And all of the text messages and all the commerce and all the messages would suddenly kick in and they'd go back out and return it in the evenings for just a couple of shillings. So extraordinarily innovative, extraordinarily hardworking, just different perhaps. And I think in the West, we tend to look down our nose at this instead of realizing, my goodness, these people are doing a lot with a little. If we can just figure out a way to adapt some of what we have to those settings, where nimbleness is necessary, where uncertain electricity is a reality, what can be produced is fantastic. And mm -hmm. then the final piece in the question you asked, uh, also understand that the informal economy is often the only economic channel for women. It's the only way that they can participate. Mm -hmm. And so because we know that investments in women and women entrepreneurship uh, exponentially 
provide returns and collateral good, that's another reason why we have to figure out how to invest in some of that and how we move subtly or gradually people, if we can, from the informal the, the formal economy. Because right now, we're not touching that. And we need to, we need to harness that and bring that forward because that provides real opportunities. You know, it, again, these technologies that we're talking about, um, you know, that have practical applications, they're modest, they're not expensive. It's just we, with our very sophisticated education, we're not creative enough mm. to understand how they can be brought to bear for good results. Terrific. Th thank you, uh, Ambassador. I want to now turn uh, to Martin King. Martin, you've been very patient here. Thank you for um, listening in for this whole conversation. Uh, I know that there at uh, Philip Morris International, you guys are going through a huge corporate transformation um, as you're trying to move towards lower risk products. Uh, we've just heard from a number of our folks about the difference between technology and innovation um, and also the need for collaboration uh, and for corporations to have purpose. So, I'd love to hear from you, um, your thoughts on any of the conversations that we've had so far, but in particular about PMI's corporate purpose and kind of how that plays into your transformation and also um, the need for science and facts in the conversation and, and how do we use science and facts in order to help make better decisions and to allow people to make better decisions. Martin. Thanks, Richard. This is an excellent conversation and I keep finding um, corollaries and interesting pieces that fit into what we're going through as a business. I mean, the whole discussion around technology and innovation, the difference between them, the science, the need for disruption, uh, not fighting the old wars, uh, using collaboration to get stuff done, uh, accelerating the use of digital, uh, the availability of information. These are all incredibly relevant to what we're going through. I mean, it's starting with the, the product itself. Um, obviously we've known for a long time that burning cigarettes is a problem and it creates all sorts of harmful constituents and smokers um, are susceptible to all sorts of issues from that. Um, so the technology said stop burning and figure out how to give smokers a product that doesn't burn. The, the critical part was finding a product that they could actually switch to. And so we worked for years on this and we had a number of failures. And finally, we've been able to come up with uh, a number of products that we believe smokers can really switch to that don't burn and therefore don't uh, uh, create the vast majority of the harmful constituents that are in a burning cigarette. And one really important product in that area is heated tobacco that we've launched in a bunch of countries. We've got almost 16 million people using it in, uh, in, in Europe, in Asia. Uh, uh, and this product is something smokers can actually switch to. So figuring out how to make it um, something that people could use versus just the idea of the technology was super important in our, in our transformation towards this. And then we realized, okay, the product is one thing, but you have to actually have the skill sets in the company. You have to be able to talk to consumers. You have to have the science behind it because you know people are skeptical of, of our industry and our company. Uh, you have to collaborate with others in order to get this this uh, verified as a third party to say that this really uh, does make a difference to smokers. Uh, you got to talk to them and be able to explain it to them. It's a very, fairly complicated concept of combustion versus non-combustion, why that matters, how do these products work, they use batteries. They're more uh, uh, challenging to, to understand how to care for them and use them properly. So being able to communicate and use digital and use all these other pieces is critical to this whole change. And, and then, of course, you need to change your whole mindset within the company and be nimble. We became the disruptors of a very stable industry. And taking on that role and being able to do that successfully has been a huge uh, challenge for our company. And, and looking forward in, in, in these times that are very uncertain, we obviously have to address these short-term issues from what's happening in the world, take care of our employees, take care of others, but we also need to keep pushing forward even faster with innovation and additional products and different additional choices for, for people out there and make sure that they understand the best thing is to quit smoking entirely. Uh, but for those people who aren't gonna quit, and there are a billion smokers in the world today, having a better choice and understanding that better choice and being able to communicate to adult smokers and give them those choices is, is absolutely our mission. Uh, and we're well on the way to, to, to achieving it. We're at about 25% of our total revenue is now coming from these new products. And we're totally committed to getting out of selling 
combustible cigarettes over the long haul, but it's going to take this collaboration that everybody's talking about to make that happen with uh, third parties, government bodies, et cetera, and, and to make sure that people understand the benefits. We recently got um, uh, authorization from the Food and Drug Administration in the United States to have this product as a modified risk tobacco product, meaning that they agreed that this was consistent with the promotion of public health. So this was already a, a pretty big milestone, very big milestone along this path and, and follows a lot of these trends that everybody's talking about. What have been some of your biggest barriers to, um, to collaboration? Well, obviously the history of the industry and the skepticism that we meet. And we also, you know, somebody talked about uh, fighting the old war, wars and don't fight the old wars. There's a very long standing old war, which is about fighting big tobacco. And what we have tried to do is say, let's stop fighting that war and let's talk about the war, which is having adult smokers have better choices. And we can be part of that solution. We are part of that solution. We have fantastic ability, proven ability. I mean, in Japan, where we launched this product five years ago, more than 20% of the adult smokers have quit smoking and switched to these other products, which are far better choice. So we can be, we are a key player in the solution, but we have to be able to explain it and be led into the room, have a seat at the table to do that. And there are obviously very entrenched groups that are uh, vehemently opposed to us having a seat at the table and vehemently opposed to us having uh, the ability to even communicate the, the science and the understanding. So having third parties that are respected, verify and vet what we're saying and make sure we are scrupulous about our statements and our, and our science. It's, 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 it's incredibly thorough. Um, you know, we submitted to the FDA millions of pages of scientific studies and data and we have to overdo it from the point of view of gaining credibility and trust and keep working at it. It's gonna take years to do that. And then of course, you know, you have to overcome all sorts of skepticism about disruption in general. When you're one of the world's most successful companies and you're uh, doing so well, your investors can be a little bit reluctant to <laughs> hear about your plans to totally disrupt your own industry. So we have to really explain it well to our, our investors and all the stakeholders involved to make sure they realize it's win-win. It's win for smokers, obviously. Uh, it's a win for public health and, and, and society at large, but it's also a win for our shareholders because we can be more successful as a company by taking market share from our competition and, and by having a much more sustainable long-term business. So it's a long-term uh, battle to keep uh, getting the hearts and minds of folks out there to, to the possibilities of the future and this great innovation. Thank you, Martin. I'd, li I'd like to take this um, back to um, Dan Rundy, to Indra Nil, and to Richard Wright. Um, what I think we've heard from um, Martin is the, the difficulty of overcoming skepticism, the importance of corporate purpose, and also the, um, the need to be or be disruptive, but also the challenges in being disruptive. Indra Nil, you uh, kind of challenged us, I think, at the beginning to think about how we could um, dominate markets that are not, don't have current leaders. Uh, what do you think of Martin's, or Martin's strategy and PMI strategy here to be disruptive in a very traditional industry? And what guidance might you have for others who are trying to do likewise? I think that's the only way to survive. Um, so if you take, for example, the energy industry, I found it remarkable that recently ExxonMobil actually fell out of the Fortune 500. That's just extraordinary. Um, but at the same time, you know, we hear uh, BP in a serious fashion, rebranding itself as a, as a, as a, as an integrated energy company, not even an integrated oil company, but an integrated energy company and moving towards truly becoming more of a renewable utility. So until you become part of the solution, until your corporate purpose is really to stop, as we've been saying, fighting the old wars about how do we justify doing oil rather than, you know, how do we become part of the new energy future? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, you'll be able to succeed as a company or frankly as an investor who's looking ahead to the future games uh, and how to sort of be a dominant force in those games rather than trying to hold on to a position in, in, a, in an industry that's eventually going to become obsolete. Mm. Richard Wright, you, um, I, when I think of Unilever, one of the, you know, the sustainable living plan, I think corporate purpose has been, you know, the defining part, you know, the defining characteristic of Unilever for the last uh, few years. Um, corporate purpose as a selling point, as a brand, uh, as, as a, just an intrinsic value. 
what are your thoughts on the on the future of that as a as, as part of um, corporate the international corporations um, world, role in the world? Um, well, I was skeptical back in the old days, and uh, that's uh, difficult for me to believe now. Um, it becomes it's becoming and has become, I think, actually a source of real competitive advantage. It is hard sometimes to persuade. I think the point about the shareholders and the immediate return um, is, is a tough one. Um, but actually, um, you feel it more and more that there's pressure to do the right thing, environmental, socially, and economically. Um, I have to warn, as you do more and more, you, you leave yourself more and more vulnerable to criticism. Mm because uh, greenwashing is a, a, real, a real danger. And so you need to be not just kind of doing one thing good on the environment. If you're doing a good thing on carbon and you're not doing something on something else like plastic waste, then you're very vulnerable. So it needs to drive through an absolute culture. And actually sometimes you can find it's, it's strong at the top and strong at the bottom of organization, but there's sometimes a hard middle. And I think we've won the, we've won the, the hard middle now and you can see this kind of like permeating through the organization um but it is it's a long it's it's a it's a long and a huge culture change i think actually Which thank you richard um now uh, i want to bring in um Nelmeni ruben and connor savoy um, you guys have both been very patient and thank you for for listening on this whole conversation um, i put you two in the anchor spot here because I think we, we need some help to kind of pull all of this stuff together. And uh, Nilmini, I'd love to get your thoughts on reflecting on everything you've heard, both domestically and internationally from a policy perspective. A lot of what I feel, I've heard a lot about in the past about how we needed to address these communities that have been left behind. The globalization is a reality, we have to deal with it, but we haven't had the real political will or the political um, policies to make that happen. You're the founder of Fix the System. You've been inside the belly of the beast there in Congress. What do we need to do? Like, what, what do we need to do from this day forward that's going to make the next century of globalization different than the last one? Um, we need to fix our political system. Okay, if we're going to grow in the United States and around the world, we really need to think about our, the strength of our democracies. So kind of picking up on, on what Ambassador Mark Green said about authoritarians bending globalization to their will and stealing the vibrancy of democracy, like we are seeing that around the world as well as in the US. Um, you know, just two days ago, the FBI warned of foreign actors spreading misinformation. And um, stable democracies are more conducive to business. Um, Dan Rundy earlier this week in an op-ed in The Hill, he talked about the World, World Bank's doing business survey and the importance of that tool um, in really understanding the challenges of starting a business. And what we've seen is countries that score well on the World Bank's doing business report also score well on the Freedom House's democracy report. So there's like a clear connection between democracy and economic growth. We saw that when Central Europe and, and Eastern Europe, you know, shifted from democracy, from communism to democracy. And um, Indrajal mentioned kind of the need to crowd in investment and what, you know, Hernando de Soto, the economist has talked about is really that, you know, investment rests on property rights and the rule of law. So we, we need to strengthen that. Um, in the US, we have to update our voting systems to rationalize how we draw our le legislative districts so voters choose their own politicians rather than the other way around. And we have to set up incentives to make Congress more functional. We're just not passing the laws we need to make our economy healthy. Um, because, you know, well, there's a lot of reasons why, but one is we've seen a higher correlation between laws passing that are connected to what donors want than what their constituents want. And I did want to just add on to what Michael McKenna said, like his point about you don't have anything if you don't have electricity is just so true. And it's really interesting is kind of picking up on what Congressman Pickering was saying about expanding internet access. We can do both of those things together, right? So we could be thinking more about smart infrastructure, like a build once approach. If you're putting in electricity lines, you're also doing 
internet at the same time because there's a really great synergy between the two. When you have better inter internet access, you also have better energy with smart grids and, and IoT, Internet of Things technology. And then um, Richard Wright talked about collaboration across gender uh, sectors. Um, Mark Green talked touched on it, but we also need to like think about collaboration across genders. Um, you know, mm. as we think about the internet, the digital divide, um, as more people are getting on the internet, it's more men than women. So every year we're seeing the digital divide increase rather than decrease. Um, and that has massive ramifications for growth and societal moving. And, um, and then like the last point is, as we think about, especially in the US, kind of building on um, the comments about immigration, if we want, we need to make sure our country stays the place people want to come to. And that was founded on the rule of law and democracy. And, um, and so strengthening that helps us uh, strengthen our, <coughs> our entire country. And kind of paraphrasing Martin King, I'm trying to touch on everybody, um, we need to just we need to not fight our old wars. We need to fight the new war going forward that will hopefully bring everyone along, uh, not just the ones who are thriving. Well, I asked you to connect the dots, and you definitely connected all the dots there, Nomeni. So thank you for, for doing that. I want to double click on a few of the things you said there. Um, you said we need to fix our voting system. We need to have uh, more uh, incentives in Congress to pass laws that don't just respond to donors. Um, and we need to fix the gender gap, and we need to make sure that we stay a welcoming place. So that, those are, uh, you said a bunch of things, but I want to kind of double click on each of those. W what do we need to do to fix the voting system? We got, I think, less than 40 days, 40 some odd days until the next election. Is there something we can do in the next 40 days, or uh, is this something for the next round? Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff for the next round, but in this round, we can start, um, like in Pennsylvania, we, we have time to change the law to allow them to, to increase the time to process envelopes. We're gonna have tons of envelopes and the way it's, the law is currently stated, it, there won't be, it, it's really crushing the amount of time they have to process it and Pennsylvania really matters. Um, we need to um, increase the number of poll workers so that you know, people can actually vote in person who want to vote in person. And um, we, we need to kind of um, let there be time to count, count the votes that are legitimately cast and like really work on kind of a patience campaign here in the US to make yeah. sure that we don't rush to judgment because that's where the foreign actors, as the FBI has noted, can come in and mess with us. So there are some things that we can do right now, um, but there's a lot of things we need to do going forward because we have this archaic system of all the laws being different in different communities and it's really hard for people to understand what their rights are to vote. We need to update mm. all of that. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I want to bring Connor in, um, but before I do, I want to just, one thing you said, incentives for, con for Congress to pass um, better laws. W what are your thoughts on that one? Oh, um, yeah, well, yeah, for you, Nomeni, sorry. It, um, so studies have shown that, that what's actually getting passed is more of an interest to the donors than the, the, the constituents. And one thing we need to think about is, is how do we do campaign finance in the US? Are there ways that we can increase the input of, of regular people? Maybe it's matching uh, for, you know, from public matching or, um, you know, restrictions on people um, accepting donations from out of state you know, what we're seeing is the flood of camping contributions are from California and New York. They're not necessarily from people who are, are within states and districts. So there's a lot of creativity we think we need to bear to make sure that the people and the money that's influencing our campaigns are from the people who are actually being represented. Thank you, Nomeni. Um, we've got about six minutes left. I'm going to give you guys a preview. I want to hear from Connor um, and ask Connor to sort of bring us home here and uh, kind of connect the international corollaries to many of Nomeni's domestic corollaries, then I'm going to swing back to our two congressmen to get our former two former congressmen to get reactions to what Nomeni just said about um, voter system reform and, and, um, and campaign finance reform. And then I'm going to ask each and every one of you for one takeaway, one, one sentence takeaway. So be thinking about what that's going to be. Then we're going to do a lightning round here to wrap us up. But Connor, bring us home if you would. 
Thanks, Richard. And uh, I'm not sure I'm up to the task, but I'll do my best here. I, I think when you look at the corollary to what Nilmani was saying on the US side, I mean, I think if you look at the international system and when you think about a lot of the things that we're talking about here, um, it goes back to the idea of collaboration. It goes back to the need for cooperation. Um, I, I don't disagree that China poses a, an enormous challenge to the United States. Um, it is likely the great power competition of this century. Um, but that said, you know, there is, someone needs to lead. And there is, and I think what, what, when I look at all of the things that we're talking about, including the opportunities, there needs to be leadership. And what I see right now is a real absence of leadership um, on the international scene. Um, you know, Richard, one of the things that you brought up, one of the things you framed with this is, is trade dead or is trade as we knew it dead? I don't think trade is dead. Um, I think it's, it's likely it is, there is a, a bit of a dormancy right now because of COVID-19. But I also think that the, the issues we see now have been building for a long time and there's a need to rethink uh, international trade agreements. There's a need to rethink both sides of the ledger. Not only the benefits, not only for the benefits for those we, who see the clear, the, the clear gains that they get from international trade, but as folks have pointed out, the people who are left behind. And I think we really need to think about what those folks need. There has long been promises for transitional assistance. There have been promises about investments in communities. Um, those, those investments by and large have not materialized in the way in which we thought they were. Um, we've focused a lot on the rural urban divide in this discussion, but it's not just a rural and urban divide. There are plenty of urban uh, areas in this country and in the United Kingdom and in, Europe, in the European Union that have been left behind by globalization, whether it's a Detroit, whether it's a Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and there, are, there certainly are urban areas that are trying to recreate themselves. Detroit has been doing a lot on broadband access and things like that. Pittsburgh has also been doing much to try to reinvent itself for a 21st century economy. But more needs to be done. And I think absent leadership, it's very difficult to understand how we get this done and how we take advantage of all of the opportunities that's been discussed here, whether it's a, a TVA for broadband access in the United States in rural areas, whether it's the, the kind of opportunities that Dr. Wright talked about that exist within Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, or, or the, the things that Ambassador Green led on when he was at USAID. Absent leadership, I, I do worry that, um, I worry that we're not gonna be able to fully take advantage of those, of those things. Well, he, so I don't mean to end on a negative note, but um, you know, I do, that's, that's, what, that's what worries me as I kind of look at these issues. The lack of leadership. The lack of leadership. Yeah. Yes. So we need we need leaders and we need leadership. So I, part of your call there, I, I assume is are you calling for the United States to be a leader? Or are you calling for yes? Who? Okay. Yes. So I'm America calling for the United leader. States to be a leader because if there is something I am optimistic about, it is about America. I am an American. Yeah. I do believe in the inherent good of of United of American leadership in the world. But I don't see a country that's been leading for the last several years. Mm -hmm. I see a country that frankly, is the stereotype that many had for the Obama administration of leading from behind. We're not leading. And in, it, in our absence, there is a vacuum out there and others with malign interests are filling those. Mm -hmm. So America needs to lead, but we also need other kinds of leaders. There are lots of leaders on this call and there are some great corporations and organizations that can also be leaders. So I personally wanna add my voice to Connors and not only call for American leadership, but also call for us to all lead individually. I tell my kids, uh, they're looking around for who's gonna lead. I said, why not you? Why aren't you the one to lead? So I think we can all be leaders in our own ways. Uh, I wanna come quickly back to our two congressmen for reactions to Nilmini's, to Nilmini's points about reform of our legislative and, and, and voting system. And then I'm gonna come to each of you for a quick lightning round. Um, congressman Pickering, you first. Uh, what did you think about Nilmini's points? They're very accurate. Uh, when I retired in 2008, we did not have super PAC. To me, that's been one of the, the most damaging aspects of campaign finance that has paralyzed Congress. And it's made everyone fearful of a primary. I was in a safe Republican district. Not one day did I ever uh, think that I would have a primary. Never uh, woke in the morning with one uh, worry that I would have a, a primary. And it allowed me to govern, it allowed me to go to the middle, it allowed me to to take on giants and battles without a fear of a super PAC coming in from out of state 
putting eight to $10 million in a race against me. So equalizing how parties and super PACs and individuals give and democratizing how the internet can, can, can with matching, really give an opportunity to equalize the, the playing field in all segments of the campaign finance. I, I do think we're in the storm before the calm uh, and that the calm will come and a consensus will emerge and it will, it will reestablish trust in trade, trust in our, our, our technology and our, our, our networks, trust in our healthcare and our education systems. But we are in the storm. And, and I don't know if it's going to be two years, three years, five years before we emerge from that. But I think all of us, as, as you mentioned, need to be working together to reestablish for the next century what is the new compact, the new consensus, mm. so that we can make the progress. And, and our democracy has trust in it. Our e economy and trade relationships are founded on a mutual beneficial trust and those core pillars that have made the last 70 years successful. And what do we need to do for the next seven years? Excellent. Thank you, Congressman. Um, uh, Ambassador uh, Green, your, your thought and your takeaway um, from this conversation. You're on mute there, Ambassador. First of all, I agree with what Chip has said. Uh, and that's something that didn't exist in my day and I, I've seen come up. But we get the democracy we deserve. So we've got to stop just blaming uh, political leaders, blame ourselves. We did this to ourselves, we deserve it. A couple things that we need to be doing. We need to insist upon constructive disagreement, not consensus, not surrender, but we have to learn how to disagree constructively in, in journalism and in politics. Finally, something I remember from my days in the state legislature I had a well-known political figure came in, spoke to all of us, Republican and Democrat. He said, how many of you here won your last race by more than 60%? And a few people raised their hand. He said, shame on you. If you're getting more than 60%, that means you have not invested your authority into difficult, tough questions. And until you start doing that, quit complaining. And I thought that was right on the mark. Uh, all of what we've heard today, I think is a great beginning. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, let's go to um, Martin King, your, your, your takeaway. It's time to fight the battles that matter for the future, not the ones of the past. Thank you. Um, Indranel. Yeah, I think uh, to achieve an inclusive and prosperous future, uh, we need to comp compete to own the solutions of the future. And by that, I mean, it's an entrepreneur, it's a community, it's a company with their corporate purpose, it's government to compete to have the best voting system, the best funding you know, model for the future industries and, and all of that. Perfect. Uh, Dan Rundy. The future, the fight of the future is digital connectivity, whether it's rural America or the rest of the world. Whoever helps solve that problem is gonna win the future. Uh, Connor Savoy. Uh, we need to lead. We need to lead. And I agree, it needs to be all of us, but we need leadership. And because in the absence of leadership, Ambassador Green's right, we get what we deserve. We absolutely Perfect. do. We have the democracy we deserve. No, many? Winning the future is, um, is a collective action with collective winners. Excellent. Richard Wright, last word. There you go. Um, I think the, uh, the, the natural human thing in the face of disaster or, or crisis is to uh, go in yourself and protect. And I think it's about time to get out there and, and solve the global problems. Um, and that's true of, of, of us all, I think. Terrific. I want to really thank um, all of you for participating in our conversation and for all of you who are listening in today. I want to thank our partners at the Washington Times and our sponsor, Philip Morris International. You've heard today that hopefully this is the storm before the calm, that it is our opportunity to get down, roll up our sleeves and restore trust, that we get the democracy that we deserve, that we need to blame ourselves and look to ourselves as leaders who are going to help us come out of this tough, uh, these tough few months and look forward to the future. 
The fight of the future is digital, according to Dan Rundy, and it is now time for us to look for how we can build a more inclusive and prosperous future that lets us governments, companies, and the civil society come together to not only lead, to lead collectively and lead for our common good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for today's conversation, and thank you all for listening in. I've been Richard Crispine. We're out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.